Let's take a look at the most interesting stories for this week's compilation. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment your favorite story you like. If you're bored, you want something in the background, or you're looking to hear about stranger teas, make sure to like and subscribe to this channel. Turn on the notification button so next time you can't sleep, you know where to go. Leave the timestamps of the videos that you want to recommend to others in the comment section. What's your best idiot neighbor story? Story 1. I was off sick one day, and my roommate came home for lunch and checked the mail. We got a letter with no return address, sent to the rooftop pot smokers, with our address on it. We knew it was for our next door neighbors, since one of them had a chair on the roof and smoked up there. Since it had no actual name and our address on it, I was like, heck yeah, I'm going to open this, it'll be hilarious. As I'm opening the taped envelope, a little bit of white powder sprinkled onto my lap. My roommate and I looked at each other and were like, um, what the F? So I got up and took the letter outside to open it. A crap ton of white powder came out of the letter when we took it out of the envelope, so we grabbed a Ziploc bag and some tongs and sealed up the letter. The letter was typed and said random crap like, to the butthole who likes smoking pot on the roof and yelling at people on the street with kids, you'd better have good insurance because I'll damage your stuff. I'm ex-military and have nothing better to do than to watch over you. You peed off the wrong guy. Blah, blah, blah. And at the end it said, by the way, the substance in this envelope is toxic, so you might want to get yourself to a hospital. Who's the mother sucker now? At that point, we were half laughing, half concerned, so I called the cops just in case. They took it very seriously and sent out everyone, cops, paramedics, fire trucks, RCMP, my roommate works for them, and the tactical unit, our version of SWAT. The street was closed off, we were quarantined to our garage, and every neighbor who was home at the time came out to take a look. Everyone was told to go back inside and stay put. The tactical team got suited up in hazmat suits and went into our house to test the letter slash envelope. We were in the garage for almost three hours. The tactical guys came back out and said the substance was found to be non-toxic, but they still had to do some more tests to figure out exactly what it was. At that point, we were taken into the ambulance for a look over and then back to the garage. Turns out the white powder was freaking pancake mix. My roommate and I, along with the cops and tactical guys, burst out laughing together. We thanked the response teams and they left. The police stayed behind to get our statements and questioned the next door neighbors to whom the letter was supposed to be sent. A detective followed up with us a couple of times. Since it was a threat and sent through the mail, it was a serious offense. The letter slash envelope was sent off to forensics for testing. Unfortunately, nothing was found and the case was closed. The people in that house caused some crap the entire time they lived there. Noise complaints, trash left everywhere outside, etc. But this incident really takes the cake. Luckily, they have all since moved out. Dong bags. Story 2. I had a neighbor on our old street who we we're pretty sure was on some serious drugs. When we first moved there, he wanted to invite us to a barbecue, but we declined because we were still busy on packing and said, maybe another time. A few months later, we hear a woman in distress, and it turns out he was beating his wife in the middle of the street. We called for her to come over here so she could call the police or whatever. The wife left him, and some drama between both of them throughout the years. It's relevant to us, though, because our family helped his wife, we were his enemy, and he harassed us multiple times throughout the years. We'd call the police, and they'd come out and basically have him stop for a time. At one point, he bought a megaphone and started yelling threats and swears at us. Another time, he started driving his motorcycle around our neighborhood to annoy us, and then used the motorcycle's back tire to throw dirt and rocks at our car. We called the police, who told him, don't do this again. He denied he ever did it in the same breath that he said he did, because my mom is evil. Back in high school, one of our neighbors moved away, and their house sold to this older woman and her mostly grown sons. She was a strange one. She cut down every tree on her property because of the bad spirits in them, the sun seemed to be popular, having people drop by at all hours. All was relatively quiet, until one day, while I was home alone, there was a knock on the door. Two gentlemen in very nice black suits and dark ties then identified themselves as FBI, and asked me if we were ever approached by a crazy lady or her sons to buy anything. I basically replied that they are crazy and we don't talk to them, they don't talk to us. They hand me their business card, then proceed on to the next house. I look out the window and I see five blue Ford Tauruses, three red Ford Astro vans, and one Viacom truck that was being loaded box after box from the neighbor's garage. 
Turns out the Suns were making those special cable boxes that got you all of the channels for free. After this, it was only the strange lady left in that house. Story 3. I had a neighbor with a drag racing car. At the time, we didn't have AC. Like clockwork at dinner time, he would start the car and revved it so loud my windows rattled. If we had any windows open, because it was summer, we wouldn't be able to have dinner conversation. One day, I'd had enough. I walked to the fence and got his attention and politely asked if he could maybe not rev the car at dinner time. I said I was cool with it otherwise. His answer was, F you. F me? <laughs> okay. I went inside and called the police and filed the noise complaint. They came out, heard it live, and wrote him up. He fought it in court, so I had to go. Judge asked me what happened. I told the story above. She asked him and his wife if it was true. They said yes. Boom. $1,000 fine. Judge told me to call the police if it continued. To be clear, I wasn't wasting 911's time. I was calling the non-emergency ordinance enforcement number. All dumb butt had to do was avoid one hour a day and we'd have been fine. I never called again because he didn't rev during dinner. One day his common law wife gets in my face about calling again. I told her I didn't, but she wouldn't believe me. He got hit with a second $1,000 fine. Turns out it was the neighbor two houses away who was a migraine sufferer and had similarly tried the neighborly approach first. They're lucky they just got a fine from the other neighbor. As a fellow migraine sufferer, when my mind isn't functioning on all cylinders, I'd probably have taken a bat to the car. Story 4. A few years later, I go to get the mail, and I hear him talking to his one- to two-year-old child, basically telling the child, the woman over there is evil, never trust her, referring to my mom. I tell my mom, and she's thinking, oh boy, what's he up to now? Later that afternoon, he drives by our house very slowly and stops, staring into our living room window. He later goes home and uses his megaphone to insult my mom and yell threats at us again. One specific threat being, you better not leave your kids alone or something will happen to them. My mom calls the police. They recommend a restraining order. The next day, and his ex-wife calls us, saying her kids heard him saying he was going to get a restraining order against us. We filed one at the same time, so we had the same court date. He told the court that my mom had been training me and my siblings, and an unnamed teenage boy, to climb his fence and go into his tree at night to harass him, and one night he caught us, and we all ran back into our house at my mom's orders. Apparently, we only harassed him when his kids were at his ex-wife's. He basically spouted insanity throughout the entire court hearing, and the judge asked for our side of the story, and we told him. The judge asked if our neighbor was taking any meds, and he told the judge, yes, I was taking antipsychotics, but I stopped them. The judge then told him that my family would never bother him again and granted us our restraining order. Dude was completely insane. I worry about how those kids of his turned out. Story 5. That guy is a freaking dumb butt. Calling the cops for the crime he committed? I wonder how many times this happens. I have crazy neighbors. They're actually very nice, as neighbors go, but the family is totally dysfunctional. They have two grown-up daughters living there, along with their teenage daughters and their boyfriends. One has a kid. There are roughly 10 people living there, ranging from 5 to 70. They keep the yard mode and keep to themselves mostly, but they are bat crap insane. I like them actually for two reasons. First, they are notorious and crazy around our town, so everyone leaves them alone. So there's little crime around us. Second, they are entertainment. One morning, my aunt was visiting. We are on the front porch, and I'm telling her all about our neighbors. I was telling her a story about how one of the younger granddaughters gets in a fight with her boyfriend at 2 a.m. on a Tuesday night. They're screaming at each other, walking up and down the street, explaining that something like that happens once a week. Like clockwork, one of the daughters comes out screaming back at someone and gets in her car. Her daughter comes out and tries to stop her from backing out. She grabs a shovel from the back of the truck and starts hitting the front windshield of the car, shattering it. They call the cops. Meanwhile, the granddaughter with the shovel calls her bio dad, who lives down the road. He picks his daughter up. Two minutes later, the cops show up, but she's gone. I have hundreds like this. Your front lawn is like an episode of Dr. Phil or Mori Povich. I almost envy you. Story 6. A neighbor messed up when building a home and put his entire home well within my property. Large piece of land with two huge clearings connected to two roads, but separated by a large isthmus of trees. I didn't notice because I had taken an eighth month vacation right after he started building. Huge property. I didn't go around and inspect it often. So I got a real estate lawyer and surveyors to confirm it was on my property. 
I was going to sell him that clearing for a good price until I went to talk to him, and he was the biggest butthole I had ever met. He essentially told me that he's going to sue me for leading him on, despite the fact that I did not know him, nor have I met him before that day. His wife flipped my girlfriend and I as we were pulling out of the driveway. Four months later, I filed a lawsuit saying he must destroy the property or turn it over to me immediately. It would have cost him more to demolish it and return the site to original condition, so he signed the house over to me. He was still out for construction costs. I was living in a single house with my girlfriend. Then I had a brand new 2,600 square foot house with all the hookups for water, electric, and cable for free. Got the land for next to nothing. Sold it for almost 50 times the value. I feel like this is better than winning the lottery. Story 7. I had a problem with a neighbor who drove over my lawn with his ATVs and damaged the grass slash shrubs. He said he'd pay for damage, but that never happened, and he kept doing it. So I put my huge trailer across their tracks to block their path. They went around it. I put up two other barriers that they also drove around. So I found this huge branch that had fallen in the woods between our properties and dragged it across to cover the third path they were making across my yard. But the branch got caught on a cable. What is a cable doing over the lawn instead of properly buried? So I called the cable company to have it buried. They said I was the only registered client on that box and to disconnect it. So I did. After the weekend, my neighbor came by going total ape crap at me for disconnecting his cable. He yelled he was going to call the cops on me. So I left. I got a call from the cops. Cops asked if I disconnected the cable because of the ATV issue. Interestingly, I wasn't even going to mention the ATV issue, but my neighbor already did. So long story short, the neighbor got a warning ticket for trespassing and admitting to stealing cable. I took an offer on my house that very day and moved. Story 11. We lived next to this big guy in an apartment building, front doors inside a hallway. Now he was a nice enough guy, but he was always cleaning a puddle in front of his apartment every other day. We'd always ask him if everything was alright, and he'd talk some incoherent crap about how he hates management. So out of curiosity, I asked management when I happened to be in the rental office, and the lady rolled her eyes and said, This idiot fills up his tub to the brim and sits his fat butt in the tub. The water, of course, floods his entire apartment and comes out into the hallway, and this idiot has the balls to blame us somehow. I pretty much said, geez, sounds rough, and scurried back to my place. If the tub story is really the truth, this guy must be dumb as rocks. What is your weirdest experience while going to the gym? Story 1. Back in the early 1980s and late 1970s, I used to work out at Gold's Gym in a western Canadian city. The gym was also the favorite workout spot for professional wrestlers when they were doing a gig in town. The weirdest thing was seeing how dramatically different some of these guys were in real life compared to their wrestling personas. One guy whose persona was of a British dock worker type would show up at the gym in a three-piece suit and speaking the poshest of British accents, and was constantly giving other wrestlers investment and tax advice. Apparently, he was an accountant as well. What was surprising was that some of them weren't faking it, but in real life, they were as rude, selfish, and ignorant as their characters. I also remember how sad it was seeing how some of the older wrestlers were really suffering from dementia, probably cumulative effects of concussions, and were literally guided through everything by other wrestlers, even simple things like getting dressed. I was impressed by the care some of these guys gave to their older colleagues who needed constant attention. However, the most interesting experience was Jesse Ventura. Of course, when the wrestlers showed up, they were generally followed around by a horde of fans, usually teenage boys. Some were hostile to their fans, telling them to F off. Others gave a quick acknowledgement and then moved on. However, Jesse would spend an incredible amount of time with his fans, especially the younger ones, listening and talking to all of them with total attention. I remember seeing him trying to do a leg press while taking questions from a crowd of boys about what it means to be a man. Even back then, when he was just the heel, Jesse the body, out of the ring, he showed that he understood the impact that he could have as a role model to young men and took it seriously. When he became governor of Minnesota, I was definitely not surprised. As a Minnesotan, we are kind of proud of Jesse. Somehow he became our governor and didn't frick it up because he was smart enough to hire the right people and delegate correctly. Occasionally, I still hear him on 93X, our local rock station. Story 2. The Weight Witches Lady walks in on a Saturday morning. I've never seen it there before. She was significantly overweight, but had on gloves and knee braces. So I figured she's a power lifter on a bulk. 
I'm warming up doing some cable internal rotations and have my headphones on so I don't see that she sets up at the cable machine behind me. I finish my set and turn around, and I see her getting ready. She's got a straight bar attached to the cable machine with the arm down near the ground and the bar on the floor. She half crouched slash squatted in front of this thing, and I'm thinking she's about to do some kind of squat when she starts waving her hands, as in the kind of hand waving a wizard does when he's imitating someone imitating Bob Foss-esque jazz hands. I couldn't stop watching. She did this for at least 30 seconds before she grabbed the bar to start exercising. And when I say grab the bar, I mean pick it up with both hands, extend it until it gets resistance from the weight, and then start standing up and half squatting slash crouching. She wasn't engaging any weight, she was just using the bar as something to hold in her hands as she stood up and crouched down slightly. She did this for three sets, and then moved to some cardio machines. I saw her a few times after that, each time doing something equally nonsensical, and always, always with the incantation and motions. I miss her, and hope she found a nice coven. I can only imagine what was going through her head that morning. Feeling good. I haven't been to the gym in years, possibly decades. But today's the day. I'll start my routine with my usual non-weighted bar-for-balance squats, and then I'll do an introductory one minute on each cardio machine at the gym. It'll be great. Story 3. The gym I go to is full of regulars in a well-off suburb in the Midwest. Everyone kind of knows everyone from the community, and you eventually get forced to know each other. I've tried on several occasions to ignore most of these people there, but you eventually get roped into some conversation, then introductions, and before you know it, the whole gym is calling you by name. One evening, an older guy who I had never really talked to other than a hi or bye is lifting like usual. I no longer see the guy and think nothing of it. Some time passes by and I'm finishing up heading to the locker room, and the guy is confidently standing outside the locker room, naked. He just seemed to be going about his day. If you have ever seen a case of acting like you belong, this would be a textbook case because he walked past several other people who didn't even say a word. Immediately, I beeline to the gym staff and tell them because there are kids who occasionally come to this area and there are also women around. The guy proceeds to hold conversations with other gym goers, dong out and everything. They try to corral him into the locker room, but he doesn't seem like he wants to go. I did my part, so I just sat in the sauna, and by the time I came out, the paramedic was there, and they were asking him questions. The staffer I alerted to what was happening said they think he had a stroke. I now see that man almost every day, and we have not mentioned that day at all since. We're all more talkative than ever, greeting each other daily, sharing quick work stories, but not a single word about when he came out the locker room and stood in the middle of the weight room butt naked. Story 4. There's this guy, me and my old lift partner used to call an Asian guy. He's this guy that's like about 6 foot 1 if I had to guess, super lean, widest lats and biggest traps I've ever seen. Anyway, I always used to look forward to watching him lift, and for a while would make sure I was scheduling when I got to the gym for when an Asian guy got there, because for months, at least 6 times a week, he would exclusively train legs. And by exclusively train legs, I mean he would be at the squat rack for no less than 3 hours. I'd always just kind of hung around to see if he would do anything else a little after my own workout, and for that period of time, he never did. Until one day, I was doing a push workout and was doing lateral raises. I was using 15s or something really light for a warm-up, and between squat sets, he came over to the dumbbells and repped out like three reps of 50-pound lateral raises. So I looked at him weird, and he saw me and ran over to rep out another five reps of 365-pound squats. I was so stoked I saw him doing something other than squatting that I told my friend, I saw an Asian guy doing lat raises trying to one-up me, and he responded by saying he did the exact same thing to him with the exact same exercise. Anyway, after a few months, he started doing an actual normal rotation of push-pull legs, which was far less entertaining, and somewhere along the way, he started using locker number 69, which is the one I usually use, so I've started trying to go before he gets there. I miss Asian guy. I'm thinking he liked you. Missed opportunity there, dude. The signs were there. He took your 69 for goodness sake. Story 5. I saw a guy in the corner with a 1,000-yard stare just frozen in the locker room. I used to work with the homeless and rehabilitation, and there's a certain look I've gotten used to that's hard to explain. It's the, I'm an addict and I'm about to frick up my life and all the progress I've made so that I can score look. This kid had that same look. So I went over and talked to him, wearing a swimsuit, goggles, and my flip-flops. 
There's a certain pushiness that comes with, I'm a stranger who thinks you're about to frick up your life, so let's talk about it, even though you don't want to talk about it, kind of conversation. Turns out, I was right. The guy had been clean for two months, and life was falling apart, and he just wanted a good score of hits. So I talked him down. I talked about how he had a bunch of white chips. You get a white chip for 24 hours of sobriety, but hardly any reds. One month, or golds, two months. I told him that he's closer than he's ever been to getting a green, three months, and that I'd be thrilled to see him get that. I have a pretty clean keychain that goes through all the colors at once, different program with different colors, but same idea, which makes a pretty good conversation piece for folks waffling on recovering. I even had him hand over his stash so he wouldn't use it once he got home. Dang, salute. Story six. There's a regular at my gym who always gets stares. She's pretty much built like a stick, and she's an older woman in her mid-fifties. I've seen her a couple of times doing this workout. She literally spends no more than 30 to 45 seconds on each machine and does them with the worst form I've ever seen in my life, as fast as she possibly can. For example, on the cable pull-down, she'll pull the handle to her neck level, let it raise to about nose level, and pull it down again. She'll do this move of about 3 to 4 inches of motion just as fast as she possibly can for about 30 to 45 seconds. Then she'll move as fast as she can to the leg press, which she'll fully extend her legs, and with her legs nearly extended, she'll just bounce the weight over and over. At no point does she return anywhere close to the start position until she's done after about 30 to 45 seconds. Then she'll go to the treadmill or the rowing machine or something and do that with the worst possible form. After about five minutes, she's done, and she'll quit and leave. There was a guy just like this at my gym. Way too much weight and would only move the bar about six inches back and forth in a jerking, violent motion. Just shake my head and move on. Story 7. I go to the gym at lunch and my office is somewhat close to a good-sized university, so some of the college students also go there since it's cheap and close. One day I was at the gym with a work buddy. We were alternating sets on the butterfly machine, which was right in front of a row of treadmills. There were a few folks on the treadmill, an older guy I'd say in his mid-fifties, and two college-aged women, two treadmills away from the older guy. They're wearing t-shirts and shorts of the local college. The women are running pretty hard, doing some interval work. After a few sets, the woman closest to the old guy lifts her shirt to wipe her forehead sweat off. She's not wearing anything underneath said shirt. The older guy looks over and notices this, and promptly stumbles on the treadmill and shoots backward onto the floor about five feet. I'm in the middle of my rep when all this happens, and I can't stop laughing. My gym buddy turns around at all the noise of the guy falling over. The two women immediately run to the bathroom giggling. I still wonder if this was all some kind of prank or just an accident. Never saw those two at the gym again. Story 8. Gyms are notoriously where the odd people congregate around here. My brother and I would always try to keep track of all the different oddballs at the gym, including the mirror man. No one knows if he actually lifts at all, since he spends nearly all observable time flexing and checking himself out in the mirror. The old book lady literally came to the gym, changed, sat on the end of a bench press bench, read from a book, changed, left. Never talked to anyone or exercised at all. The flipper. Guy hung around the free weights, never lifted anything, but really liked his music. Every 10 to 15 minutes, he would randomly do a backflip. That was his workout. The hot chick. The girl in yoga pants and a sports bra would set up at the squat rack opposite of the benches. She would play on her phone, sometimes for close to an hour, until a specific large guy would start doing bench press. Suddenly, she was doing low weight squats and some random hip thrusts right in line with him taking breaks between sets. Everyone knew why she was there. The Zumba guy. This one isn't a specific guy, but there always seems to be one guy in every Zumba class. He's always super into it, and it flows through him and his interpretive dancing. Story 9. As a wise man once said, they have two types of people, men 65 and older, and guys who cover their dongs. Maybe it's an age thing, but do not talk to me in a locker room. Frankly, don't talk to me at all, but especially in the locker room. If my dong is exposed to open air, that is not a time for a conversation about gas prices. Also, perhaps not weird, but definitely not expected. A few years ago, I was super intense about going to the gym. I went five days a week, had a personal trainer, the whole deal. At one point, I was getting off the treadmill, and a guy stopped me, saying he had seen me at the gym before and could notice a marked difference in my physique, and that I was working out really well and shed a lot of weight in like six months. I thanked him, mentioned some things I did, and moved on. But I always remember the random compliment that made me keep going. 
Because of boot camp, I saw 82 dongs a day for 13 straight weeks. It just doesn't bother me to be naked, hold conversations naked, clean my balls while maintaining eye contact. It only bothers you for as long as you let it. Story 10. I swear my gym is actually a gateway into the fae. One time, I saw a fit man with impeccable flowing locks stare himself down in the mirror. He just kept saying, yes, and growling a bunch. Then he went over to the stretching area and did what could only be described as jazzercise while listening to aggressive hip-hop on his headphones so loud I could hear it from the squat rack. Periodically, he'd holler out grunts and hype sounds and curse words with the music. I'm pretty sure he was a lynx in a human body. One time, I'm on the bench and I hear two dudes you look freaking amazing, bro. You're the best looking dude in this gym. Nah, you are, bro. I turn around after a set, and they're identical twins. There's this old guy who wears a toupee to the gym. It's hideous. Like he decided when he bought this wig, I'll be ginger now. But he's like a swarthy Mediterranean white dude. When he works out, the toupee wax that affixes it to his bald skull melts and runs down the side of his head. He never seems to mind. That twin story is gold. I wonder how often they've done that. Story 11. Uh, this one's kind of weird. Moving to a new place, no friends slash nightlife, so I went to the gym twice a day. One night I was closing the place down with a swim and was almost the last person in the building. Nobody was in the locker room, but I could hear a shower on. Walked into the shower and assumed that some butt hat had just left it on. As I got closer though, I saw a shadow. I just went into the shower stall I was adjacent to. Men's showers, so no doors. There was a man there leaning hard against the wall with a heart on out front and one hand reaching down behind his back. When I turned on my shower, he froze, turned towards me in shock, and I watched a 10-inch dill pickle dough flop out of his butt and hang between his legs. He then proceeded to drop it and awkwardly try to kick it to the side so I wouldn't see it when he picked it up. I can't unsee it. Story 12. I hate to run, but run about a mile a day at a 10 minute mile pace before I go and do weights. Like, I hate it so much, I wish for a heart attack to take me away at about minute four. In any case, the treadmills at our gyms have big timers on them that are easy to read. I get on the treadmill one day and see that the guy beside me is running a 5k, a preset on the machine, and has been on for about four minutes. But he's going fast, like a full out sprint. I punch in my 12 minutes, 10 minute mile plus 2 minute cooldown, and start to run. We finish at the same time. Dude ran a 5k in about 16 minutes, full on sprint the whole time. I was just kinda in a daze thinking about it for the rest of my workout. Story 15. Skeleton of a man was psyching himself up for a 225 pound squat. Deep breaths, loud grunting, and smelling salts included. Proceeded to get under the bar, squatted what seemed like less than half a rep, more like a quarter rep with bad form, re-racked the weight, and proceeded to yell, frick yeah, as if he was at the powerlifting meet. I think he had too much pre-workout in my opinion. Oh god, pre-workout? There's a guy at my gym I would describe as the Incredible Hulk, but not green. Dude is huge. I swear, his pre-workout is like the souls of infant children or something. Story 16. Not really weird, but this huge guy was weightlifting at the gym I frequent, and he farted, and it was the longest fart I've ever heard, like at least 30 seconds long. He couldn't stop giggling like a little girl, and then everyone else started laughing and clapping like he just performed a theater piece. It was surreal. I was on the treadmill once, had to fart, let a little bit go to see if they were going to be noisy. I didn't hear anything, so proceeded to fart my way through the rest of my cardio. Eventually it dawned on me, I had headphones in. HR employees, what was the most ridiculous slash hilarious complaint you ever received? Story 1. I'm not an HR, but someone called HR on me. I work with a few people that aren't that fluent in English. One of my coworkers was trying to explain to me what kind of tacos he ate and could not remember the word for stingrays. So he took my notebook and drew a picture of a stingray and wrote the word turtle. So it looked like this. Crudely drawn stingray plus the word turtle. A lady I work with went through my notebook, saw the picture of the stingray plus the word turtle. She called HR because she thought I was writing notes about her in my notebook. She said that the horribly drawn stingray plus the word turtle meant that I wanted to punch her in the face because she's slow like a turtle. Definitely a reach. I didn't get in trouble. I was just told by my boss that I'm not allowed to talk about turtles anymore in case it upsets her. I rarely talk about turtles, so this isn't really a problem for me. 
edit. I'm still relatively new to this, so I'm not sure if this is an acceptable way to do this, but I'm just going to edit the original post to answer everybody's burning question. He was not eating stingray slash turtle tacos at work. He was telling me his favorite tacos to eat when he's at home. He's originally from Mexico and is in Iowa on a TN visa. Maybe in his coastal Mexican town, it is normal to eat stingrays and turtles. I have no idea, really. All I know is I couldn't help him in the slightest when he asked me if I knew where to get stingray meat. Story 2. I recently had HR tell me that one of my staff had been undersupplied in his annual leave over the past few years, and he needed to take at least 10 days off over the next 6 months to correct the leave liability. Paid at a higher rate than usual to make up for the error, of course, He could take a two-week block, or say, a day off a week until he'd use the leave, his choice. He was so enraged over being given extra paid holidays that he wrote to our general manager to complain, screamed at me, his boss, I know my rights, refused the leave, or even to discuss why he wouldn't take it. Anyway, I wrote his performance review this week, and there are multiple goals about professional, respectful behavior that need to be reached in order for him to get a raise this year. (laughs) Yeah, not so much. Oh, and he still has 10 days off. I can actually think of a reason someone might react that way. They've been doing something illegal, which would be discovered if anyone else was assigned to their job for a day. And they never got around to thinking up any way to prevent that discovery. It's one of the reasons why senior financial personnel and major corporations are effectively forced to take vacations in blocks large enough that someone else has to do their job for a few weeks. This staff member of yours might not have the same level of responsibility, but if there are any numbers or stock they're in charge of, maybe get someone to audit that while this guy's away. Story 3. Not HR, but my company is too small to have one, so it just falls on me. Used to have an accounts receivable clerk who would snack at her desk all day long. We were pretty casual, laid-back company, so it's not a big deal, as long as she was getting her work done. But then it escalated to having food constantly being delivered, tacos in the morning, pizza at lunch, Chinese in the afternoon. It was bizarre and made it difficult for her to work when she's eating full meals all day. I was on the fence about saying something until she brought in an Instant Pot. She plugged it in and cooked a freaking pork roast at her desk, poured in barbecue sauce she brought and ate it all day. I was dumbfounded. It was so strange. I pulled her aside the next day and told her how unprofessional it was. She was shocked and told me I was being unfair because I never specifically said no one was allowed to bring in an Instant Pot. She truly seemed genuinely surprised that she wasn't allowed to do that. She scaled it down after that, but I sometimes wonder how much further she would have gone if I never said anything. Story 4 I told my coworker as professionally as I could that it wasn't appropriate for her to be using her phone while at work, teaching kids supposedly. She spent all her time on Facebook. Little kids would be screaming and wailing on each other literally 10 feet away, and she was totally oblivious. She complained by email to HR that I was rude and confrontational. They pulled me aside and told me to be more careful about how I spoke to coworkers. I told them my side of the story. They spoke to her again. She got a written warning. They didn't tell me what happened, but I gather from office gossip that she lost her poop and started shouting at the HR staff. Rude and confrontational, perhaps? Anyway, she's on her final warning now, and she has a habit of hitting on the married dads of our kids, involving children in adult matters. Why hasn't your mommy paid your fees yet? Don't you want to come to daycare? And generally being an unprofessional, self-absorbed pain in the butt. So, can't wait till she gets fired. Story 5. My HR department once fell for a phishing email and sent everyone's W-2s to a random hacker. HR then informed everyone via a mass email with no red receipts at 9 p.m. on a Friday, even though multiple people were on vacation and had left instructions to be called in an emergency. When I got back from my trip a week later and expressed my concern about her not actually notifying me about this, she totally brushed it off. I said, do you realize that I need to freeze my credit and I'm seven days late in doing so? She said, no, don't freeze your credit. You won't be able to use your credit cards if you do. Another time, during a workers' comp claim, I needed to speak to our claims adjuster, and she said an adjuster doesn't get assigned until after the claim is settled. That's the exact opposite of how that works. She was my stupid complaint. Story 8. Once was asked to investigate a sensual harassment situation where three different women were coming on to a male co-worker throughout their shift. I took down the details, got the names, easy-peasy investigation. So I thought. 
A week later, nobody by these descriptions or names had ever worked for the company. I decided to talk to the gentleman again. After a lengthy conversation where things didn't quite stack up, I asked him how these women communicated with him. I poop you not. With a straight face, he looks me in the eye and replies, telepathically. Like I'm some kind of idiot. I had never sent an employee for psychological evaluation up to that point, and I hope never to have to again. So yeah, I was asked by a delusional schizophrenic to conduct a sensual harassment investigation on the voices in his head. Story 11. I don't know if this story fits, but I'll tell it anyway. I went to HR once to complain that my manager refused to give me a couple of vacation days. The HR lady reminded me about the boilerplate rule that vacation time must be mutually acceptable to the employee and the company. I then pulled out six more vacation requests that had all been denied, including one that was denied in writing for a reason that was not permitted. I asked her if the company is allowed to say that it's never acceptable. My last request was undenied. Story 14. My work has one men's toilet. Had one coworker complain that another guy kept using the bathroom before him and doing big ol' poos. But the way he said it was like this guy knew when he was about to go, ninja'd in just before him, dropped a massive stinker, and then forced the other guy to marinate in the smell when he went for a leak afterwards. We ended up adding a can of air freshener to the bathroom, and the next complaint that came in was the poop guy never used it. Hot Topic Employees, What Are Your Horror Stories? Story 1. Maybe not so much horror, but just terribly annoying and cringy. Number 1. I was wearing a Hellblazer t-shirt that had a cover of the new 52 revamp on it. I had two neckbeards come up and start trying to keep me on if I was really a fan of Hellblazer slash John Constantine. It included the actual questions of... Well, what's your favorite arc? Or who is your favorite writer slash artist? Number two, Halloween is coming up. It's the Halloween season after Suicide Squad came out. So we have both versions of the Joker's outfits. The other from The Dark Knight. Both versions were unreasonably expensive. The total for The Dark Knight costume, if I remember correctly, was about $200 altogether. Because you had to buy the coat, the undershirt, the pants, etc., the fabric of the costume was just a little bit better quality than the $50 version you get at any Halloween setup store. We had a guy come in about 30 minutes before we closed for the night and wanted to try on the Dark Knight version of the Joker's outfit. The costume was hanging up on the tallest rack, so it required me getting a pole and pulling down each one because the size he needed was large and each component of the costume. He tried it on, enjoyed it, and wanted to buy it. I went ahead to go ring him up, and then when he saw the price of it, he started flipping out. He started complaining that he could find this costume anywhere else that he wanted at a cheaper price. He wanted to know if there's any coupons, or if I could give him my employee discount. I told him there's no way I could do that. He starts flipping out and says he needs his costume tomorrow, and he doesn't have that money now. He took me about 45 minutes after closing to finally leave. He did not buy the costume. Even before Suicide Squad came out, working Halloween around Hot Topic was always cringy with all the Joker and Harley Quinn people. Story 2 I worked at a Hot Topic in 1999 to 2000. We used to get a fair amount of strippers that came in because we were the only place around that sold see-through vinyl bikini tops and 6-inch stack boots and stuff like that. Anyway, our fitting room was basically a hole cut in a wall with a mirror and a thick curtain that had to be pulled closed just right. One day, a stripper came in to try on a bunch of stuff and really didn't even bother with the curtain. Apparently, she was so used to people seeing her naked that it wasn't a big deal for her. Granted, this was a weekday morning and she and her boyfriend slash manager slash bodyguard or whatever were the only people in the store besides my manager and me. At one point, she just stopped using the fitting room altogether and was just using the full-length mirror on the door to the stockroom slash office. My manager and I really had no idea what to do because at this point, she's got about $1,500 to $2,000 worth of merchandise that she's probably buying and this lady is good for both business and morale. She didn't seem to be worried at the prospect of anyone seeing her and the way our store was set up was really narrow and long and the display fixtures were tall and bulky. It was very difficult to see into and out of the store unless you were standing in the center aisle. It made loss prevention a nightmare, but really allowed this lady to let her freak flag fly. She finally put her clothes on at the cash wrap as she's checking out. 
My manager gave me so much crap after that because I was so embarrassed that I couldn't even make eye contact with the customer while I rang her up. That was the largest transaction I ever rang up in my time there and paid for it with the largest wad of cash I'd ever seen in my life up to that point. Too long didn't read, a stripper came in on a slow day and treated the store like her own private dressing room. Story 3. Worked there for 13 years. So much weird, but that's just retail in general. Caught a guy pleasuring himself into women's shoes in the dressing room. People did it with each other in there more often than you'd be comfortable with. I worked for them when Columbine happened. We carried a brand of clothing back then called Serial Killer, which featured pop culture pics slash references and some edgy sayings, like a pic of Bruce Lee that said, Revenge, or something like that. The morning after Columbine happened, we got an email to pull all the serial killer clothing line off the sales floor, as well as every trench coat in the store. By the end of the day, I'd already had to call security twice, due to people showing up at the store and harassing me for supporting those psychos and training the next ones. Then the TV networks showed up and pretty much camped the front of our store, harassing every customer as they walked in slash out, asking them why this dark lifestyle attracted them. The mall ended up having security just hang out in front of our store and walking our employees to their cars for a week afterwards. Honestly, it was the best job I ever had. The company was really supportive at the corporate level. I still have friends that work there. They pretty much left me alone so long as I made sales, so I had carte blanche to set up my stores the way I wanted, even if it didn't look like the planned merchandising setups they sent out. I had direct access with every department, so if I felt my stores couldn't sell something they sent us, they'd let me transfer it somewhere else, and vice versa, get more best sellers in. Honestly, if it wasn't working for every weekend and closing a lot of stuff, I would have continued working there. Story 4. This was my first job in my college town, and generally, I absolutely loved it. You're treated like some super cool mini-celebrity by all the little mall rats, The management was generally great to their employees, and the work wasn't too hard in my small, low-volume store. However, there was the issue of Valentine's Day. That year, they were promoting all these different corsets and lingerie, as well as the Get In Our Pants campaign for the skinny jeans. Management wanted the employees to try and show the corsets not just as lingerie, but as fashion items, maybe paired with the skinny jeans, increased sales and all. So there I am, Valentine's Day, in a black corset and tight black skinny jeans and boots. Way more sensual than 18-year-old me with a still-developing body was comfortable with. In comes Creepy McCreeper, a 50-plus something dude who says he wants to buy something for his wife, but wants some help picking it out. Not once did his eyes look at my face. The entire time I'm helping him, He's staring at my butt or chest or making weird comments about how I remind him of his daughter or being uncomfortably comfortable telling me explicit details about his wife's body. He then asks me to try it on and show him so he could see how it would look on his wife. Luckily, shy 18-year-old me awkwardly laughed it off and got him past the register and out of the store. I loved that job, but Jesus, did it draw some weirdos. Story 5 Thursday is actually my last day with Hot Topic after four years. In general, the company is amazing to its employees, and I've met some incredible people. But boy, do I have stories. Number one, I once found a condom in our anime section. It was open and filled with something. Number two, we had a girl who I am positive had some mental issue because she would get into the fitting room and try to lure anyone in there to help her, then try and seduce them. She was actually pretty, but young and filled to the brim with crazy. Number three, Alice Cooper came into the store once, totally unannounced, and brought a teacup pig. Absolutely wonderful person. Gave our metalhead associate tickets to his show, and this dude lost it. Number four, also met Machine Gun Kelly, Mayday Parade, We the Kings, and Max Green of Escape the Fate. Machine Gun Kelly and the vocalist for We the Kings were total buttholes. Number five, we had a guy get thrown against the front gate on the morning of a Funko Pop release. In general, the job has taught me some pop collectors are grade A buttholes. Number six, had a woman ask me if she should go back to stripping after her C-section, then lifted her shirt to show me the scar and her boobaloo baloobies. Number seven, we found out there was a group of mall rats who wrote fan fiction about the staff at our store. 
I never got to see any, and I'm glad for that. Story 6. Finally, one of these where I have actual personal stories. I worked at one for about a year, and you would see a lot of cringy stuff just because of the base it attracts, but nothing terribly horrible, usually, besides one time. I was working a Saturday afternoon shift, it was about 3.30pm, and the store wasn't busy at all. There were only two weeboo looking guys in their 20s in the store, then a group of four teens walked in giggling and looking suspicious. They go up to the weeboos and start singing the Nyan Cat song. Me and my coworker are like, what the F? One of the weeboos gets aggressive and is like, step the F back, step the F back. He then effing grabs a chain wallet and starts swinging it at them. I call security and my coworker is just screaming, hey, 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 trying to stop it. One of the kids calls the weeboos fat butts as he's still trying to hit them with the wallet and responds to their insult by calling them daddy's jazz stain witch butts. But by now, three security guards come in and break it up while the silent weeboo is saying the kids started it. Both parties are escorted out, different exits, while we give a report on what happened. Never saw any of them again. Story 7. Spent almost five years working at one in the early 2000s. Being in the Midwest, we had a ton of juggalos, but they were actually pretty nice people in general. I had a group of kids ask what I would do if they set some clothes on fire and flicked a lighter multiple times. We mostly got weirdos who wanted to bang in the dressing room or lifted up their shirts to ask me what gauge their nipple ring is. We had this one girl who came in weekly, and I don't think she was all there. She would sit at the listening station for way too long and then leave. One day, she sat down and put the headphones on. She had a plastic bag with her filled with empty glass bottles and peaches. Yes, the fruit. We noticed it was leaking onto the floor, but just let her do her thing she put the headphones back and looked at her leaking bag. She had a mildly disappointed look on her face, but immediately looked at her watch and yelled, I'm going to miss my bus. She ran out of the store and up to a trash can outside the store. She held the bag up high and yelled, Peaches, meet your fate. Threw the bag in the trash and sprinted off. That job was weird. Story 8. Former employee of a couple years in high school. I loved that job. The biggest horror story that sticks out in my mind was this guy that would always come in with his kids. He was a huge insane clown posse fan, and from the looks of it, he let his kids, both boys, they were I'd guess maybe 7 and 8 at the time, listen as well. They always had hatchet man stuff on, and pretty witchin haircuts. They always misbehaved, just running around the store screaming, sometimes crashing into stuff, and the dad gave no Fs. He was often pretty rude to us in the store about not having specific merch or being out of stuff in his size. He was a large guy. I had and still have no business in what that guy does with his kids, but I always felt a little bad that there was a good chance they would end up in a bad way. Other than that recurring instance, for the most part, our store was really fun. Story 9. A petite friend is currently a manager at one, and her issue is always a customer that become too often a repeat customer obsessed with her or another female employee. Currently, it's a guy that swears they would have everything in common because he likes all the things in the store too, as if she curated it, and now has to stay 500 feet from the store. I heard stories like this from my local one several times. They ended up promoting this giant poop kicker goth chick with purple hair to manager and she would straight up threaten creepy dudes, had zero problem calling security or police if someone was harassing an employee. I went to community college with a girl who worked there, and she said about two weeks after that manager got hired, nobody had been harassed since. How to find the perfect hot topic manager? Pick the scariest, most intimidating person you can find. Story 10. I worked for Hot Topic for about seven years. My store was apparently the juggalo store of the district, and I think the state. Working for that company as long as I did, I was pretty used to ignoring people's crappy taste, but the juggalos were different. This is in central Florida, so it's on average about 90 degrees most days, and always humid as heck. These kids were always very overweight, wearing a massive black insane clown posse tee, those ridiculous 30-pound black trip pants with huge pockets and all the hardware, chains and straps, hanging from them. And they were drenched in sweat. Their hygiene was almost always awful. 
They always seem to show whenever a new Insane Clown Posse shirt or collectible would arrive and would smell up the store and pay in wadded up, sweat-soaked money. It was just all around unpleasant. The smell would linger for a bit after they left. It was not pleasant. Story 13. I was working on the sales floor, and this guy, at least in his 30s, and pretty high, starts making sensual comments to me about this 15-year-ish old girl that was checking out. I asked him to leave, and nothing more came of it, but it was chilling. Also had a co-worker get fired because they were selling weed out of the back room. She'd sneak it into their bag while they were checking out. Also had a different off-duty co-worker come in hammered late one night to tell everyone working how great we were. That was actually kind of nice. Besides that, it was a lot of kicking out vaping teenagers and letting the quiet girls from my school try on skimpy Harley Quinn bikinis in the dressing room. Story 15. Former employee, I worked a whole three months in the summer, so all the kids were out and about. I was stocking Disney merchandise, and I couldn't help but notice a kid underneath one of our clearance racks. I heard some strange noise coming from there too, so I crouched under and looked at the kid. He had a button, needle and all, in his mouth. I asked him where his parents were, and before I knew it, he swallowed the pin and ran out of the store. I couldn't leave and go search for the child, so I let security know about the button kid. Never knew what happened after that. I can't seem to forget button kid, though. What's the scariest gut feeling you had that came true? Story 1. This is going to sound lame, but going up the escalator one evening after my soccer practice, I was thinking, what if I get up there and I see some woman getting harassed by some guy? What would I do? Would I help? You know, typical kid stuff, thinking about whether or not you would do the heroic thing. I then started thinking, what if this actually happens and I thought about it before? Nobody will believe me. Then I thought, what if it does happen and I actually thought about thinking about it, etc, etc. All that nonsense. I was about 13 to 14 years old, and it was late, really dark outside, and almost nobody was out. When I arrived at the top of the escalator and out of the subway, I saw a woman walk past. Just as I see her, a drunken man starts yelling at her, catcalling, calling names. He sounded really violent and like he could actually harm her. He started jogging drunkenly towards her, and out of nowhere, without even thinking about it, I just screamed out, Hey! As the word came out, I remember thinking, crap, you idiot, why did you do that? Now you're dead. And out of nowhere, my mouth started going off again. Leave her alone. Again, trembling, really scared, being 13 and all. I remember feeling like I wasn't controlling my body or actions. They just happened. I was holding my soccer ball under one arm and my workout bag in another, so it wasn't really fit for running or fighting. Fighting? I was 13. I was a twig at best. He turns to me and starts yelling insults. He starts walking towards me, saying how he will kick my head in like you would kick that ball. I remember thinking, dang, I gotta run, but my legs refused. It felt wrong to run while she was still there. Knowing I couldn't fight or run, I just kind of circled him while scared poopless until she had walked away far enough. Then, as he almost caught me, I jogged away in the same direction the woman went. I remember walking, trembling, being really surprised at what I did, because none of it was on purpose. It just happened. Words and actions came out of me like a renegade fart. Eventually, when we got far enough, the woman turned around and thanked me. I remember feeling like a major boss and proud of myself. I told my parents, and they didn't believe me. Told my best friend, and he didn't believe me either. So I stopped telling anyone. Story 2. I woke up to 4,219,804 calls from my family, literally everyone but my brother. I had a gut feeling something happened to him. Then my mom told me he had been in a car accident, and they were still waiting for information about it. I had a gut feeling he was not alive. I had never been so sure of something in my life. I'm pretty sure I went through the five stages of grief backwards. I started off with acceptance immediately. I pretty much accepted that he wasn't here, and before my sister called me with the confirmation, I just knew it. My gut feeling was just that powerful, I guess. A friend asked me, do you remember that guy by the name Thomas P? I immediately knew he was no longer alive. It wasn't usual. We were 18. It was the first ever of my friends who passed away. Hit by a bus. Like you, I went from acceptance to being scared like poop. Like I said, it was the first person from my generation that passed away made me realize that death is not only about my grandparents' generation. Story 5. By the time I was 13, 
My mom had been battling cancer for a year and a half. It was a few days after my birthday, and she was due for an IV port surgery the following morning. Just a simple day surgery, right? She came to my room to say goodnight, and I freaked out. For some reason, I knew this surgery would not go well. This is after she had lung surgery and multiple bouts of chemo and radiation on her chest and brain. She reassured me that it was fine and that we would go bowling a few days later. She never returned home. During the surgery, her remaining full lung collapsed, and it went entirely downhill from there. Just over a month later, she passed away. I have no idea what caused my fear of that being the end, but unfortunately, I was right. Story 6. When I was in my late teens, I was hanging out with a friend in my room. Suddenly, I started feeling panicky with something telling me to leave the house. I decided to listen to my gut and told my friend we had to go to the store right now. Went outside to find my dad passed out in his truck, looking really sick and pale. Me and my friend pulled him out of the truck, and he called 911, while I performed CPR on my dad and saved his life. Later found out he had overdosed and choked. Who knows what would have happened if I didn't have the overwhelming urge to walk to the store for no reason. Story 7. I worked at a hospital and frequently picked up extra shifts. I worked overnight and had asked the supervisor to go ahead and put me down to work the next night. Well, as the night went on, I just felt awful, like completely doomed. I had never wanted so badly to be home. I lived an hour away from my job. So by the following morning, I called my supervisor and asked her to remove me from the schedule. So I went home feeling unexplainably scared. By the time I woke up, I was getting calls that an EF5 tornado had hit the town I worked in and the hospital I worked at. Hmm, what if everyone thinks you did it? Story 10. I used to work as a nurse in an old people's home. I had great contact with one of the little old ladies there. One night after having helped her get to bed, I said, Good night, see you tomorrow, knowing I was coming in the next morning. Oh no, she said merrily, I don't think we'll see each other tomorrow. It felt kind of off, and I went home feeling strange about it. When I came into work the next morning, she had passed away peacefully in her sleep, no more than a few hours after I'd left her. Story 11 when I was 12, my dad was a semi-truck driver. One day after school, I had a horrible feeling about him going to work the next day. I had begged him in tears to stay home from work, but he just told me that he'd be home in time for dinner the next day. He passed away in an accident with another semi early the next morning. If my child ever begs me to stay home, I'm staying home. Story 12. That the deer would run out onto the road. Something in my head told me to slam on the brakes, so I did. I ended up taking fur off its butt, barely clipping it. That's your subconscious doing its job. You probably saw the deer, or evidence of the deer, and even before you realized you saw it, your brain was already looking out for you. Good guy brain. Please leave your stories in the comments. I'd love to make a video of them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.